chair of the Rochester Select Board, I find that due to the state of emergency still declared by Governor Scott as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic and pursuant to Addendum 6 to Executive Order 01-20 and Act 92, this public body is authorized to meet electronically. In accordance with Act 92, there is no physical location to observe and listen contemporaneously to this meeting. However, in accordance with the temporary amendments to the open meeting law, I confirm that we are providing public access to the meeting using the Zoom platform. And if you want to see how to log in through this platform, you either look to the posted announcements through town, go to the town website, or you can request a direct email from the town clerk. And um, I think that before we move on with the meeting, does ever, anyone have any additions to the posted agenda at this time? Martha, you want to unmute yourself and tell me what it is? Or maybe I can unmute you. Um, You figuring out how to do that, Martha? Yeah, I thought I had. There you go. There you go. Okay. Yeah. I'm sorry. I apologize. I That's won't take right. your time. Um, I had talked to Pat Harvey about this. Um, um, in past years, for 20 some odd years, I've, I've done the 4th of July parade. And um, if we're going to have one this year, I would have to send it, start getting everything organized the beginning of May. So the governor has said on TV that um, large. Um, uh, oh, could you not hear me? Should I? Should yeah, I stop? I'll forward it to you. I'll forward it to you. Yeah. I can hear you just fine. Okay. Well, he's got. A, he had his phone, so I didn't know. Uh, anyway, right. in the past, the, I mean, in the on TV, the governor has talked about uh, having large gatherings and stuff being okay, but he was he was requiring people. He wanted to. Requ um, ask people to wear masks and, and keep a distance. I don't know how uh, we can do that with a parade crowd. Um, and there are several suggestions that have been happening. I just wanted, to, I won't take up a lot of time tonight. I didn't mean to, but I just wanted to see how um, Patty and I have discuss, discussed this. I wanted to see if if any, if any uh, Frank and um, Dune had any opinions about this. Um, I'm kind of iffy. So, in that so every Martha, time let's just add that to the agenda at this point, and then we can Come back and talk about okay, that. I'm sorry. Okay, I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Pardon me. Um, okay. Just uh, oh. Okay. Um, I have. Um, can somebody forward this to Joan? Pat, could you forward this to Joan? Because yeah. the computer is offline because I plugged into my this one and yeah. All right. Thank you. Um, any other additions to the agenda at this time? Um, Kirk. I don't know if you wanted me to speak on anything that's going on up, uh, well, uh, allegedly up in Montpelier, or it's all happening in our our living rooms. But uh, uh, no. if you want me to, you can add me, yeah, or absolutely. I can just be quiet. Yeah. We're you know, glad that you're um, glad that you're here um, to to offer that. Appreciate it. Right. Sure. You. All right. Um, last call for amendments and. Um, let's go to the minutes of the last meeting, and there was I did. Um, so on Mato, your last call. Mato, uh, uh, I should have said something, Dune. <laughs> yes. Okay. Yeah. Say something. Um, this should be quick. Um, Vic and I want to um, donate uh, one or two picnic tables for the park. They were they were uh, well used last summer, and I think there's going to be even more people that want to want okay. to eat on the park. Okay. Great. But Thanks. I know you have this, the town has to take care, take them in. So I knew it was a question too. <laughs> they put them out today on the park. Oh it's yeah. Right. Yep. They did put the, um, the, um, the old tables out on the park. So that's, yeah, that um, sounds great. Okay. Well, um, hold, hold off on putting them, putting them out this week. Yeah, we'll we're going to have the fertilizer spread on it. Sometime oh, this week. Uh, okay. We're going to have Frank, to move Frank, they, already, yep. they already put them out today. I know they did. Okay. Oh. So we're yeah. still going to have to move them. We haven't even ordered the new ones. So, okay. 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 That's fine. <laughs> All right. We'll go ahead with so, that. So, what? Uh, you got an addition there, Jeff? 
Yeah, the Vermont Council on Rural Development's Climate Economy Model Communities Program. Um, they have a uh, deadline into this month for um, participants, a participant in that program. Um, that program, uh, the Climate Economy Model Communities Program may be advantageous to us in, um, well, I'm getting into the detail of All it. Right, I know you cool. just so wanted we'll to add that to the, sorry. Yep, Great. got it. Um, anybody else before I charge ahead? Okay, um, we're going to the minutes of the March 22nd meeting. They look good. I had one correction um, when in Jones updates that um, Frank had noted that he was under the impression that we would incur the cost of raiding the storm drains. I think it'd be um, cleaning the storm drains, right? Instead of raiding right. the storm drains. I mean, we could raid them, but it's, yeah. Um, <coughs> Did anybody else have any changes on those minutes? No. All right. I did. I'd, all right. Then I'd move to approve those as um, amended there. All in favor? Second that. Second that. All in favor? Yep. All, all right. right. All right. Thank you. All right. That one. And. Um, we have. Um, a handful of um, guests here, um, Mark Shea and Gordy Merrill and Sarah Perry and Josh Castangri. How do you say that? Yeah, pretty close. Castangri. Yeah. Castangri. You guys um, all here on the same topic? We, we are, yeah. Yeah. Do you want to, um, what, what's on your mind? Sure. So uh, I'm Josh Casting with GMP um, and Sarah Ludwin Peary is here as well, who'll talk about this. We we're going to talk about the resiliency zones work. I didn't know you want to hit that right now. Um, sure. Since you joined, we have that on the, um, on the, yeah, yeah, might as well. Since you guys are, um, you don't need to listen to the whole town sure. laundry before we talk about this. Yeah. Yeah. So I'll, um, I'll start and then I'll kick it to Sarah. Who's just, we got a few slides to talk through, but um, we basically, I think some of the folks uh, in this committee and the energy committee probably saw that we had sent something over um, related to some work we're doing around energy resiliency overall. About a year ago, uh, GMP filed a climate plan that was focused on doing upgrades to the electrical system to basically continue to improve resiliency and reliability as we get more impacts from, uh, from climate change and weather and a number of things. And part of that was to work with towns, especially towns that are, you know, frankly, either more difficult to serve or more rural in the woods and the mountains. Um, and electric reliability can be more challenging. Maybe communications infrastructure is, is more challenging. Um, and kind of dive into those towns and look at the communities and some of the information and infrastructure there and see if there's a targeted approach to resiliency that might even involve using solar and battery storage, for example, creating microgrids or even very small microgrids at individual facilities. Um, I'll caveat all with, with this all with it's very new, something we're, we're just starting to think about and figure out. And um, we have a number of towns like yours that, that we're, we're chatting <laughs> with and thinking through this with and really looking for some partners as we pilot this, this idea, basically of, of uh, creating resiliency beyond just the traditional poles and wires that we've done uh, in the past while we still continue to do that. Um, so I think uh, Sarah has, although I just got a text from Sarah that she needs to be let back into the Zoom meeting if somebody has that power. She got, she got yep, to reboot. Out. Okay, there we go. Awesome. And, um, and while we're at it, I don't, um, Pat, did you get that um, link sent to Joan? Cause I don't see her logged in yet either. I did. She got back to me asking if I had the link in another email, which I, I don't. I just have the one email. So she was asking. Right. Um, okay. I sent the, yeah, the, the, the numbers to get into Zoom. Mm -hmm. So she really just needs to go into Zoom and type in the meeting numbers and the password. Okay. Yep. All right. Um, thanks. Um, want to continue on then? Sure. Yeah, no problem. So um, so it looks like, yeah, Sarah has a few slides up. So I will turn it over to you, Sarah, to kind of talk through what this is, and then we can hit questions and go from there. 
Yeah, thank you, Josh. So a little bit of background on the overall program. So this was brought around. Can you all, can everyone see my screen? Is this good? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, great. Um, so this was sort of birth out of our proactive climate plan, which involved several targeted initiatives to make the grid more resilient. And this includes a lot of traditional approaches such as undergrounding, installing insulated wires, replacing poles, and adding batteries, all with the goal of preventing outages and helping towns recover more quickly when they happen. But in addition to this standard grid work, we wanted to incorporate a much faster timeline because of our anticipated change in climate and also focus on something new, sort of a different approach, which we're calling resiliency zones. So a resiliency zone is still something, a new idea that we're developing together, hopefully we'll be developing with you, which is oriented towards creating a community hub that stays connected even when the lights go out. And this could look like several different things. We're expecting it to include some combination of batteries, local power generation like solar and then communications infrastructure. And this will be planned custom in partnership with the communities we're working with. So I believe some of you went to Panton this week, is that correct? Uh, yes, there were uh, four of us from the energy committee and, and, uh, and I am the town energy coordinator. Okay, great. So that project was sort of a new type of thing that we're pioneering. And for those of you who don't know, the microgrid was partnered with Panton several years ago, and it was organized by doing the local solar first, which provides clean power close to where it's being consumed. And then we're adding a layer on top, which is battery. So that will allow energy to be stored and then used when it's more expensive or used when other sources aren't generating. And this saves all GMP customers money. And now that those two portions are completed, we're adding additional microgrid capability, which will be online this summer. And microgrid capability basically means that if the rest of the grid goes down, this microgrid can function entirely by itself. So we can still be generating and storing and using power. Um, without the broader connection. So we're reaching out to you because we've done an analysis of several Vermont communities, looking at data and reliability, communications infrastructure, and some CDC vulnerability data. And we've identified you as a really good target candidate of a town that could really benefit from this. But we're also so, interested in hearing about your community's interest in partnering with us. Yeah, hold on one Sarah. Second. What is CDC social? The central, um, the Center for Disease Control. Um, okay. It's it's sort of a multi indicator okay. um, analysis of just different census data. Were there any more questions on that? Great, so what's next? So we like to work with about three communities each year in our pilot phase, this being our first year. Um, and our partnership with Panton began several years ago. So this will be a little bit of a lengthy process. And on the GMP side, we're here to offer help with planning expertise and leveraging funding. But we also really want to get to know your community. Um, I sent around before this meeting, I think possibly just to the energy committee members, a community questionnaire with some questions about your contact info, your planning and your community infrastructure. But we're really here tonight to just hear your thoughts, hear any interest, answer any questions you may have. So, um, Jeff, um, what's your what's what's your take? Uh, this Sounds this good. looks very good. interesting and wonderful. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I you know believe that it will require some matching contributions from our community, which um, you know I know can be a difficult issue to deal with uh, from a tax standpoint. But um, it does uh, move us towards our town plan of increasing uh, renewable energy sources in the community. Um, and by golly, if anybody uh, knows about resiliency, people in Rochester do. I mean, with Irene, uh, even our dead were disturbed. Um, and it took an awful long time for us to recover from that. Um, 
And my understanding is we came very close to having worse problems uh, with Brook Street almost taking out the water supply. So all of these things, uh, you know, I, I don't anticipate our weather is going to get kinder um, in the near future. So I think that uh, this is uh, very interesting and very appropriate uh, at this point in time. So I would, um, is this, I, I would assume this is something that could happen in phases. It doesn't have to be one fell swoop or how, how would you, um, how would this unroll, unravel? Yeah, so um, I, I believe Sarah was gonna send, so the, the next thing was gonna be to start to just gather um, a little bit more information. Um, you know, one was, as Sarah mentioned, identifying towns and then two, are the towns interested in, in exploring this with us, which um, sounds like sounds like you are um, without any commitments, obviously, or anything like that. We're just we're just kind of figuring out what this looks like. So there's some there's a, a set of questions um, that Sarah and the team have put together that and Sarah, did you send those? You may have sent those already. Right? Yes, uh, I received them in the okay. I received them in the afternoon uh, without but a lot of these are going to need to go to the select board for the response. And, and it's, you know, definitely it, if, if there's some you don't have answers to or it's too much, it's, it's a lot of effort to get, don't worry about it. It's really a data gathering exercise to get a sense of what kind of, what kind of infrastructure there is or, you know, more vulnerable inter infrastructure, communications, things, um, things like that. And we'd start to, um, and keep in mind that this can be both, um, you know, for example, we chatted with a town who has, um, they have a lot of fiber optic to the home. And in that, in that case, when, when power goes down and the fiber, the little battery backing up the fiber modem is out, that's it. There's no communications for some customers that live in the outskirts of town, including, including some elderly folks that they don't have a, a good way to connect. So that was an example of some information that was really helpful in terms of how can we think about serving customers like that differently, even if that means batteries in the home themselves. So all of that stuff is open for, for discussion and for us to think through with you. Um, so, you know, we, we'd look to have you take a look at those questions and, and data and you know, we'd be happy to jump on the phone with anybody at any time, talk more about what we're thinking there um, and then continue to have meetings with the appropriate folks to talk about certain infrastructure. Maybe we'd look at, you know, if there's certain community centers or, um, you know, shelters or anything like that. Those could be prime examples of locations where we look to uh, build up the resiliency and the electrical reliability for a spot like that. Um, there's the potential for more funding coming available too from various plans from the, the governor just announced recently, and then we'll see what happens with additional infrastructure uh, money, but there's potential there for, for some additional funds that we're all, I'm sure you folks are keeping an eye on. We're doing the same thing to see so so would you be looking at matching money from the municipality or individuals or both i mean it so that really depends if if a match is even needed it ultimately depends on what is the solution because the interesting thing about the solar and storage is depending on um depending on the size of it certain things it actually can pay for itself because we use it for peak shaving and a number of different things in the case of like power walls for example when we put them in a home, there's a fee that the customer pays um, in addition to, but it's a, it's a much reduced charge for the battery because we use it for a whole bunch of other benefits. In the case of a resiliency zone, we might be able to bridge even more of that um, to make that even lower cost, if any, for a customer, for example. That would all have to be determined. So what, what I would imagine happening is we'd look at, um, we look at the different types of infrastructure that you have with you or, or other, any other vulnerabilities look at what kind of solutions we might even do like an RFP to see what some of the solar providers might have for um, options or ideas and crunch all that through. And we look at, all right, here's, here's how much we can leverage this to save the rest of our customers money. So we don't need to charge anything. And then is there a gap and how much is that? Um, so it's not like it would be a, a, a one for one match. It'd likely be a much smaller contribution needed for a lot of these things. What, what is the, do you know what the megawatt hour load is for the village? That I do not know, actually. Um, 
Jeffrey, it's a good question, but something that we can pull pretty easily with the metering data. I don't, Freeman, I don't assume you have that info handy. I was just kind of trying to get a sense in comparison to Panton. They've got a five megawatt uh, um, load being served by, I think one of their committee, Energy, Energy Committee members said uh, 40 acres of panels. Yeah, um, that, yep, that is a, that one came about, basically we had built the solar project. It was a five megawatt solar project with, uh, you know, over 40 some odd acres and then tacked on the battery later and then created the, the microgrid. Um, my guess is we'd be looking at something quite a bit different, obviously in, in the town and, and it might even be, it could be, you know, if there's, a, if there's individual facilities, for example, it might even be rooftop plus battery storage or there is adjacent space. Um, that's all stuff that we could definitely look at with you. Mm -hmm. Rochester's town plan has identified areas that are constrained and other areas that where there is, um, Good solar exposure. I'm not. There was one designation. I've got to find out what the. Uh, I assume it's an acronym stands for. Um, but we could provide that map, um, and I sure. think our select board also has got a pretty good idea, much better idea than I do of all the kinds of parcels that we have around the town. That would be great. That'd be really helpful. Pat. Um, I, of course, I have a couple questions. <laughs> um, so you're talking about uh, putting in a solar field, and yes, our town plan does have designated areas. Um, do you have any concerns about floodplain with so, solar fields? Yeah. To, um, if so, if you were to do solar like on the ground in a field somewhere, that you definitely have to take into consideration floodway and floodplain. Yeah. Um, Again, not having looked at anything specifically in your uh, area yet as to where a, a, a project or like I said, it could be a bunch of rooftop projects. It doesn't necessarily need to be on the ground, but um, but yeah, flood floodway and floodplain would be considered. I don't think I don't think they're doing solar at all in the flood. I plain. don't think so. That's yeah. not a good idea. No. No, no. <laughs> How many towns are you? You did I get? in the presentation that you're doing three towns at a time. Um, that's our, that's our, our hope is to like, just to get like, get this <laughs> going, um, to work through some pilots to work with two or three towns, just, you know. So we would be um, uh, the top, in the top four towns to have gone into this program. Correct. Um, why Rochester? Well, I could let Sarah. Um, so, I don't know if Sarah. Oh, yeah, Sarah's still here. The um, we did a ranking of electric reliability data, um, communications using, and this is using, and, and I'll I'll say with the communications data, it's certainly not a perfect science, but we use the state data um, in terms of where broadband either existed, didn't exist, um, fiber, and that C, the sent. CDC data that Sarah mentioned is really just some census data that uh, spreads out across Vermont. So we ranked all the towns in GMP's territory and essentially had the top 15 that we we sent to um, information on. And we've heard back from a few folks like yourselves. Not because we're the troubled child. <laughs> Are you the troubled child? That's cool. <laughs> Well, well right. we are from being in the woods and, and, and <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. No, I mean, you know, the 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 tougher it is to serve the, the area electrically, right. It, that raises it. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, we we can we so part of that climate plan also includes a lot of traditional distribution improvements. Just, you know, as we're thinking ahead a little bit. That stuff's going to continue to be very important. We're going to continue to build poles and wires, get them roadside where we can, get them out of the woods, bury where it makes sense. Um, but inevitably, that stuff takes a hit when we get nasty weather, which isn't lightening up. And so we're trying to jump ahead where in some areas and think through different ways of serving customers. Um, and that's kind of why this is a pilot at this point, too, is that it's we see it as a potential to grow. And, you know, we'll have areas where maybe we don't even have poles and wires feeding it at all anymore because we don't need to. We have another source mm -hmm. to the customer. It looks no different. You're just, your lights are on 
way more often, hopefully, and you're able to recover more quickly when an event happens. So it's, it's part of the, the kind of the broader thinking as we're looking at this. I have a question. Is, is this possible to run in under this project to run power in places that, that do not have power lines like Jerusalem Hill or West Hill? Uh, that I don't, I don't know. I don't know the geography well enough to know where you'd put something in. I mean, I would say that what we'd be looking at here is probably serving um, existing facilities that probably are connected today, at least to start with. Usually we're thinking about, you know, key infrastructure that's like, you could be water pumping, communications hubs, uh, emergency shelters, first responder facilities, that sort of thing as we, as we start thinking through this. Is it fair to say, Josh, that it's more likely though to be um, focused around uh, the village as opposed to the whole town area? Likely to start. I think that would make the most sense. Again, if there's you know a pocket, let's say, of of customers that um, are you know for one reason or another just more sensitive to to outages, and it's a much much harder area to feed, and we can think about creative way to to help those homes stay on, you know, we could look at that as well. I would say that the, the, the village, the community center is probably going to be an area focused to start for sure. Yeah, I say that because it you didn't makes more you sense cover to the entire way. town of Panton. You just did that, did an area around the town center. And that yeah. may have been just because of the size of your, of the PV array too. I mean, so yeah, that's a good question. Well, that, it was a couple couple of reasons there. One, islanding an entire piece of the distribution system with only solar and batteries hasn't been done yet in the United States, and there's a whole host of reasons why. But um, basically, when when you have a, a power system, you've got to make sure that the protection is going to work appropriately. If a tree comes down on the wire or a car hits a pole, the the all the protection in place. We have fuses and a bunch of things. They have to function. So when you're islanding with just solar and batteries, you still need all that protection to function. So that's why we're starting with a smaller area. We could actually feed probably most of that town if we want to, you know, when we're ready to expand it. But to start, we've got kind of bracketed it with the town garage, the town hall, and there's a few homes and farms in between. Um, and then once we've got that first one under our belt working and running, we're gonna look to expand that and, and build uh, elsewhere. But that said, doing individual facilities, like if it's a, a shelter you have or, a, you know, again, so that is a lot easier to do today. We did that with the Vermont State House recently, and you can do systems like that uh, much, much quicker. Sorry, Frank, I think I cut you off there. No, that's quite all right. I, we do have a lot of backup generation already on a lot of our facilities um, that's already in place. So that might help with what you're trying to do. Yeah, definitely. As... And especially, again, as you're, um, so like the state house example, they were actually, I mean, their gen set was 40 years old and it was time for, they were looking at a replacement there anyway. So then we, we worked with them to do a storage system instead. Um, and, in a, and then also the nice thing is we're able to tap into it and give them a revenue stream uh, for using the battery storage. So things like that, like if you have gen sets, they can be part of the system, or if any of them are nearing replacement age, it's something to just keep in mind as well. No, it's, it's um, pretty exciting. It's um, exciting to be picked as a as a possibility to to get in on this. Great, yeah. great. So, yeah. um, I mean, I I I speaking for me, but I think the, the other two members of the select board would agree that. Um, um, yeah, let's investigate this. That, that yeah. Absolutely. 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 Yeah. And I'm sure with uh, the likes of uh, Jeff Gephardt, Greg White, and Frank Savory in our town, they'll enjoy working with us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We'll figure something out again. Yeah. So, so what's going to show up here? What's huh? the next step, Josh? So you you have those um, questions if if you're able to take a look through those and start pulling any of that information together. Um, and like I said, don't, you don't make it a huge effort. If there's things that, or you have a question for us as to what it is we're looking for, um, feel free to reach out to Sarah and myself. We'll gather that information and then um, 
but I mean, really just plan to, to, to get, get down there and, um, get a little more familiar with, with the area and the town and, and then look, start talking about some potential options. We'll look at the data. Um, we'll have to, one other thing I should add is once we start this process, we'll have a regulatory process on the GMP side that we'll go through. Cause basically we have to show that, Hey, if we're going to do this resiliency zone, let's say, um, we can't do it a cheaper way with poles and wires and things we have to prove out to our public utilities commission. So that's all part of what we'll pull together and work through, um, with, uh, with your help and, and information there. Great. I have one quick question. Is it possible to lease batteries and not own them? Yep, it is. Yep. Yeah. We've done that on the smaller scale side, the residential, but, um, there's, there's that works with any size system. Thank you. Yep. Um, does anyone else? Um, I have the questions, right. so I'll I'll forward uh, the questions to all of the select board members. Uh, yeah. Great. Thanks. Great. Really appreciate that. And thank you, Dune, for the time. Thank oh, you, thanks Paul. For coming. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Take care. Good night. Thanks very much. Um, Jeff, since we've been um, chatting about um, some things in your um, in your wheelhouse here, do you want to talk about um, the uh, climate economy initiative you're talking about? Yeah, um, just noticed uh, uh, over the weekend, uh, actually, I guess it was maybe Friday, um, that uh, the Vermont Council on Rural Development has the Climate Economy Model Communities Program. Uh, basically, uh, their goal is to help communities model rapid change by implementing energy efficiency, transportation system transformation, renewable energy generation, working lands development, and entrepreneurship and business incubation to spur economic resilience and progress. Um, I'm getting a bit um, nervous about um, our focus um, in our crisis here with our high school and the kind of uh, disjointedness um, between that and our buildings and our community as a whole. Um, I think that the right at the moment, uh, our need to figure out what to do with that high school is really gotten us in a very narrow focus. Um, yet I hear that maybe we need to move our town garage, maybe we need to move um, our town office, maybe we need uh, something, uh, some affordable housing somewhere in the mix. And of course, we need to do something with our high school building. Um, but what I see this uh, model communities providing is not money, uh, but um, expert assistance in reviewing community needs. It's, it's almost like going back, it, it seems like we got a really good start with Envision Rochester and then the pandemic hit and then the school issue came up and we've really shifted gears and we've gone to that. Um, but I'm having a really hard time trying to weigh what's the best thing for us energy wise and, and you know, climate wise um, with all these things up in the air and, and our focus on the school building can continue, uh, should continue, but I think that we, we need to look at things more holistically and I'm hoping that this, this program would enable that. Um, I am drafting a letter that I will send to the select board for approval um, to see if we can get that one town seat in, in this uh, program going forward. Um, I'll get you the letter and the uh, emails that I have the, the information about the program and see what you think. Um, the deadline for it, though, is coming up at the end of the month. Um, so I've, I've had conversations with uh, the program director, and uh, I think it might be helpful to us uh, to broaden our view again to see if we can come up with solutions across the board. No, that sounds great. All right, well, I'll finish drafting the letter and give it to you guys for your attention. Great, thank you, Jeff. Now, um, Pat and Frank, anybody else have any questions for him on this? 
No, I, I just have them get us the letter and yeah. we can read it over and see what we think. And um, Catherine, is that a hand mm -hmm. raise or is that a high five? I agree that the whole, and I, and Frank and I were talking about this on Friday, the holistic approach <laughs> needs to happen. It really does. So thanks, Jeff and Frank. And I think yeah, and I, I don't mean any criticism of anybody involved in any aspect of this. I mean, it, it's people are, are putting in great effort on this. Um, but I think that if we're going to get it right for the community, we've got to broaden, keep our view a little broader at the moment. Much agreed. Yeah. Well, we, we, you know, the planning grant is going in tomorrow. Uh, and we've gotten some fabulous endorsements uh, letters from Green Mountain uh, Economic Development Corporation, from Two Rivers, from our Planning Commission, uh, from many different organizations and some individuals. Uh, so the phase, if we get awarded, the, uh, the planning grant is an opportunity to work with our consultants to look, at, to look at a lot of things. I mean, it's very specifically related to the proposal within the grant, but uh, it's an opportunity to to look beyond too. Yeah. yeah, it's a big component of the analysis of all of our town properties that we yeah. should be making. Great. Um, thank you, Jeff, for your energy in that energy committee. Um, I think that um, this could segue into um, Kirk, you wanted to give us an update on what's going on and, and the conversation up to this point is pretty energizing. What have you got to add to that? Yeah, uh, thank you for, for having me. And uh, and yeah, I, I, I'm always happy, as you know, my, my plan has been to visit you every month. And if you want me to update what's going on, uh, you know, we've got another, in another month, uh, it'll be, what will be into halfway through May and we'll be getting close to the end of the legislative session. And so if you want me to come back next month, happy to do it. Um, yeah, I, 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 those kind of programs are, are fantastic out there. Um, I have had the great uh, fortune of being uh, put on the Commerce and Economic Development Committee. So um, so my committee is one that, that uh, reviews a lot of those programs and, and funds them and, um, and it, by all means, take advantage of, of, of those, those resources. And, uh, um, you know, uh, and your, the economic development corporations and, and even the League of uh, Cities and Towns, uh, a lot of those organizations are, are, have resources to help you uh, navigate through those. Um, the legislature, uh, probably a large part of what the legislature has, legislature has been working on has been um, uh, uh, initially was COVID relief for our communities. Um, originally, the idea of bringing that out of uh, the general fund. And then uh, since uh, uh, the feds have, have thrown a whole bunch of money uh, now at us trying to figure out how to allocate all that. Um, the, uh, the COVID uh, recovery bill that the House passed um, last week, which the Senate is, is now working on, uh, had $97.5 million in federal stimulus funds that we were channeling to businesses, schools, housing, workforce development, broadband, and a whole bunch of other things. Uh, and I could break that all down for you if you want, but, uh, uh, but, but there's, a, there's a bunch of money out there. Uh, and uh, some of that money is, is, as I said, it's for broadband, it's for uh, transportation. There's a lot of money going into the transportation fund to fix roads. Um, and uh, yeah, there's just a bunch. Now with the, uh, uh, the ARPA funds in particular, the America Rescue Plan Act, um, uh, you know, so there's a bunch of money that's going, as I said, into transportation stuff. So, so when the time comes, there's, uh, if you have roads, bridges, things like that, that, you're, that you've been neglecting to, to fix because funds or something like that, that that'll be the time to, to jump on that. Uh, additionally, um, it looks like uh, last week we had a presentation from Rebecca Ellis from uh, Senator, I mean, uh, Representative Welch's office and from Karen Horn from the Vermont League of Cities and Towns on, on exactly those ARPA funds that are coming in. And uh, essentially, 
besides the large pots of money for different very specific projects, it looks like there's going to be a each municipality in the state is going to get um, a certain amount of funds. It works out to $293 per person um, uh, based on the 2010 census. Um, and uh, my best calculations is that Rochester should get about $322,000 uh, uh, out of that. And uh, it, you'll get it, uh, the latest news, uh, you know, and everything has to be taken a little bit with a grain of salt because all the federal rules and things are still a little bit fluid. Uh, but the la latest guess from Welch's office is that uh, the towns should have 50% of that uh, probably by around June 11th. Uh, so you'll have half of it, and then you'll get the other half a year later. You have three and a half years to spend it. Um, and, uh, and the advice is uh, don't, as perhaps one of your uh, select board members suggested, uh, just throw a big party with it. Uh, but, uh, uh, but rather, uh, you know, really uh, go through these processes with uh, economic development and, and uh, a league of uh, Vermont League of Cities and Towns uh, to try and figure out the best utilization of those funds. Uh, and these town specific funds, uh, you know, don't spend them on your bridges and roads and don't spend them on your on your broadband, um, you know, because there's other pots of money for that stuff. Um, the uh, Vermont League of Cities and Towns uh, it, it was also given a large chunk of money uh, as as were the regional development corporations uh, like Green Mountain Regional uh, Economic Development Corporation to uh, fund staff for them to help towns navigate how to use your money. So there should be some some resources available to you. Um, but uh, but yeah, uh, uh, but this this is your chance to 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 fix up your your uh, outbuildings and paint your whatever, you know, all the stuff that has been neglected for, for uh, quite a while because of funds, this would be the time uh, to, to make, make a strategic plan on how to best use it. Um, and, um, you know, and in addition to that, there's going to be about $270 million going to the Vermont school districts. Uh, so, um, so again, that's a separate pot of money that you, so you won't have to take that out of your 300 Three hundred thousand for your schools, that kind of stuff. Uh, so it's, it's a lot of money, and uh, and the trick will be is to is to use it wisely. Um, so, a question so far? Now you can come every meeting if you're going to give news like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, this is probably the. This is probably, I'm peaking here probably. Yeah, we're right recording now. this though. We can play it over again. Uh, there you go. <laughs> um, can we, um, what category do our sidewalks fall into? Um, is that under transportation or would that be in other? That's a good question. Um, I, I would I think, think that would be in a different category. Yeah. <laughs> Not. I wouldn't think we'd have to use this 300 thousand for anything like that but yeah yeah we'd have to look into it yeah i think I yeah i think a lot of that's going to depend where those sidewalks are and how much you can show that it, it whether or not it relates to uh, transportation you know uh, those kind of things it, um, it completely relates to the village the sidewalks are in yeah. terrible disrepair yeah. and in terms of the pedestrian use and the whole yeah. um business district so if it's not under transportation what is it under and it's really and if yeah. you could find that out for us it would be very helpful yeah, yeah I, I, and i will i will do my best to to do that right now it's uh again um prior thing is is that the federal bodies are saying hey we've got this pile of money we'll tell you what the strings are later uh you know and what and what the what the restrictions are later and so they're they're still drafting all that, and uh, and so we don't exactly know uh, which things. That pot of about three hundred thousand, that was the best estimate, uh, uh, is the one that has the least number of strings. Um, but as you as you uh, dig into some of these other 
other sources that'll, you know, uh, then, then, you know, you'll have to follow, you know, you can't, unless you can rationalize, uh, you know, that your project fits into broadband transportation, you know, um, you know some of these other uh, buckets, basically. Uh, but yeah, so the, so this is, uh, you know, it's uh, exciting, exciting times for a lot of communities that have not been able to yeah. sustain things to keep things up and so this is this is our chance um and otherwise um you know the um the at this point uh, just for the legislative process there's a thing called crossover which is a couple of weeks after town meeting day that's when uh all, you know that basically any bill that the house wants any chance of getting passed by the end of the legislative session or the senate on their side both of those have to sort of have those those approved in their body so that on crossover they switch over and the senate looks at the house bills and the house looks at the senate bills and uh and then they we each fiddle with each other's bills um and uh and and sometimes they even sometimes the other body won't approve a bill uh so it never gets to the governor's office to sign uh and that's the stage we're in right now we're, so right now the house is looking at all these senate bills the senate's looking at all these house bills uh and uh because the session ends in the middle of may and so we're, we're starting to get down to a crunch um but uh um uh, yeah this coming week probably the uh, bottle bill will be a big big one coming down the the expanding of the of the uh of redeemable bottles uh there's been some controversy around that um and uh uh last week they proved the house proved uh uh decriminalization of small amounts of therapeutic uh, uh anti-opioid medications um you know and uh so you know, there, there's a bunch of things that have been coming through. Um, my own committee, uh, we've been working on uh, again commerce. Uh, when I joined commerce, I didn't understand it. Also included uh, exciting topics like insurance, uh, and so uh, so we've been uh, 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 you know uh, working hard on understanding um, uh, things like. Uh, apparently, insurance companies that cover dental procedures uh, have been telling dentists what they can charge for services that the insurance doesn't cover. Uh, and uh, um, and and just it's just they want to be able to tell their people who are buying the policies that the policy is cheaper because we just told them they can't charge for these other procedures we don't cover anyway. Uh, so we're working on little things like that to remedy that. That's, that's stuff my committee's working on. So it's not as exciting as anymore as the $300,000, uh, but but it's important stuff that needs to get done to kind of keep keep things going. Yep. Great. Yep. Thank you, Kurt. Yeah, so, yeah. And, uh, and hopefully I'll have, have more information about some of this stuff uh, uh, next next month when I when I come visit you. But thank you for for having yeah. me. No, thanks for being here. Thank you, Kurt. Yeah. Um, well, we could sure throw a hell of a Fourth of July parade with three hundred thousand dollars. <laughs> <laughs> Fireworks? No. Uh, <laughs> I don't know how I feel about the whole thing in general. So we'll discuss it when it's time for me to discuss it. Well, I was just segueing into that. Um, oh, okay. I don't know <laughs> if we really can um, make a decision yet. But what were you saying? And when's the? When do you need to know by? I need to know by like the first week of May. And from what I've I've been trying to get in touch with the the governor's office and haven't had any luck with that. But from what I see on the news, he's had several um, statements that he's allowing large gatherings, but he wants people to remember to be wearing their masks and and keep distance, et cetera, et cetera. And um, I don't know how easy that's going to be. Not very easy when you have such a crowd. Pat Harvey and I discussed this, and she said that. Terry Severy mentioned that possibly if we did have the parade, we could make a point of having, um, you know, how everybody generally stays on Main Street, 
to watch it, we could have um, the parade route go around the park. And so we could ask people to, to gather on all different sides, all four sides of the park, you know, that would spread the crowd out, uh, yeah. um, that kind of thing. But um, the more I, I've, I've seen a lot on the news about places that have opened everything up so quickly and then and of course they can't control what people do as far as masks or whatever and then they have a, a batch of new cases so i i will admit i'm nervous about um i would like to do it because i know people like the parade and i would like to have it you know if we can um but i also am nervous about um causing a problem you know so i don't know i, I just wanted to know what the the uh what the uh select board thought about this. Yeah. Kirk, were you raising your hand? Did you have some input on that? I may, I may. So this is the 4th of July? Yeah. Parade? Our 4th of July yeah. parade that we've had for yeah. many years. Yes. What, what do you think the turnout is for that? Oh, hundreds, hundreds and hundreds. hundreds. I mean, yeah. I would say someone estimated once about 750 800 people but i don't know that okay. I, I i certainly never counted everybody I, i'm too busy doing other stuff yeah so the so the current um plan uh which is always subject to change um of course depending on how numbers go but the the goal is that is that certainly by sometime in june that the uh rules would be uh for outdoor gatherings and events uh an allowance of 900 people plus an unlimited number of vaccinated people. Okay. Now, of course, masks, distancing are all still still in place, but that's, but that's the goal that the governor is, is shooting for by, by, by uh, early June. Uh, so if you're thinking there's only seven or 800 people that show up, you're probably, uh, it, you know, you're under the numbers that the, that the state. Yeah, I mean, would it want. might be more. I don't know. I've never yeah. counted it. It is a, certainly a good crowd. Anyone could tell you. Um, mm -hmm. And in the past, the Lions Club has always done a barbecue too. Now, the gentleman who was in charge of the barbecue, Mr. Baxter, died last fall, and I haven't been able to get in touch with the man who who helped him. So I don't know if that would be a part. If that would be, I mean, if we should just have the parade. If we are going to do it, just have the parade. Period you know, and not worry about um, having anything else. People could go to their own homes and have something to eat themselves, you know. Yeah. Um, Pierce, Pierce Hall is planning to do the barbecue. Pierce Hall is planning to do a barbecue. Okay. Correct. All right. So who is in charge of that that I should get in touch with if we go ahead with a parade? Get a hold of Becky. Be uh, Becky Donay? Okay. Correct. Right. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I, 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 like I said, I, I have, I want to do this. The other problem for me, particularly, is that as of last summer, I developed a condition called lymphedema, and anyone who knows me knows that now I can't walk without a walker. So I can do all the organizational part of this, no problem. Sending out the letters and getting things organized and calling to get judges, et cetera, et cetera. I can do all that. That's no problem. Um, the problem, I, I just have a problem with. I'm going to have to get some volunteers to help me like set up the judges stand, blah, blah, blah. Stuff yeah. I could always yeah. do before with no problem. I, I need help with now. I can't do it myself. Um, but I'm, you know, I, I, I want to make, you know, uh, you know, happy memories for people. And I know yeah. people were disappointed last year. It's just, I'm a little, I, I'm surprised yeah. at how nervous I, take I am. It. You want to be careful. And yeah, definitely. Yeah, I'm surprised at how nervous I am about this. I never would have, before this pandemic thing, I would never even thought about it, you know? Pat, did you have yeah. a comment you want to make? Yeah, I mean, we'll watch it again for the next couple of weeks. I have heard that Warren is going ahead with their parade, but they're not having the after parade party up at the school. So, um, you know, there's a little bit of guidance. Um, we just still have to follow the state guidelines, the state guidance. And um, it does look rather promising that we would be able to go forward with it. But we'll take yet another couple of weeks to make that decision. Yeah, sure. yeah. I mean, I, I um, will have our next select board meeting is on the 26th of April. So yeah, maybe by then I'll know and, and yeah. enough. You yeah, know, I don't know. Sounds good. I don't want to take up any more of your time, but I, I did want to get your feelings on it. And I. Um... Yep. No, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, so while we've been talking so much about activity on the park, I guess um, Sue, um, 
uh, your um, your offer of some picnic tables. And uh, Frank, that's a very good point about they're going to fertilize, so we would not want them to appear immediately. But um, what did, what do you have in mind, Sue? Just donating yeah, a couple of pictures. Do. There you go. There you go. <laughs> I'm a stakeholder. She's coming. <laughs> Out on the picnic table. Yeah. Yeah. Here I am. Nice. Much fear. Um, so I was just reiterating what um, Frank said. We wouldn't want them to show up right away because of the need to fertilize the park, and they're already going to have to juggle around the picnic tables that went out today. Yeah, I'll double check with that. We don't. We haven't even ordered them, so it's going to be right. a month or more. Yeah. Yeah. Sue, yeah. did you say you were ordering two picnic tables? That was uh, your plan? One or two. We don't we have two. to price them first. <laughs> okay. How about, a, could I say a couple of, or should I just say donate and donation of a picnic or table? Or? Why don't you say one, and then they'll be okay. surprised. When you go. Then we'll be surprised if there's two. Okay, great. Thank <laughs> you. Um, I don't see any problem with that. Um, like I said, the timing, and, and I guess we'll look and see. I don't know what condition are the the ones that they set out today. I know they've been um, getting they got used quite a bit last year actually. Oh, they did. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, I I talked with John earlier, and the only reason why they put them out so early was because they needed to get some stuff that was behind them from the old firehouse. <laughs> yeah, so yeah. Rather than handle them two or three times, they that decided they just put them out. Uh, I suggested they store them in the at the town office next year, so that they would be out of the way down in the garage. There, they would probably be fine down there. Yep. I, th I thought I'd look at the ones at the cafe and see who did those if they they look good. Mm -hmm. They came from Rutland. I know Dave went to pick them up somewhere in Rutland. Ah, mm -hmm. I think they're eventually the cafe um, applied for a, a um, what do you call it a. Um, a permit to, to expand their porch around to the south side of the building and I think the, those poor those um tables will eventually be up on that porch but oh, I'm not sure but they're uh, nice looking yeah so yeah I think they're um, too big but we'll see we'll see <laughs> anyway right. that's another subject <laughs> okay well well thank you Sue and I okay. guess um we'll see um those are the uh Additions to the agenda. Joan, you finally um, were able to log in and get hooked up here? Uh, yes, it was a, a different pathway for me, so I had to figure it out. <laughs> but okay. um, So I have a bunch of things that are sort of getting down from the visionary to the granular level. Um, first, uh, uh, you know, Dubois and King annually does an inspection of our wastewater system. Um, part of the regulatory process. They do an inspection every year and they give us a service contract about this time of year. Um, so they've sent us one for $3,000 and I haven't been able to compare that to last year, whether it's the same amount or close to it, um, but it needs to be signed uh, so they can get to work on that. Um, and I've left it in the office. It just needs one signature from one of you, but I, I sent it around today by email so you can all take a look at it. Um, next, uh, the Bethel Mountain Road uh, payment from VTrans. There's one more payment left that's been hanging out there. And uh, I got wind that that final payment is in process. Still can't tell, tell you what the time frame is for it, but they have to go through this rather involved, involved process um, at the state level where they have to put it through a vetting system to make sure that all the pieces have been properly vetted and, and approved. So they just got that started last week. I get an email just saying, we're doing this. Please let us know if anything has changed. Nothing has changed. So the wheels are grinding and we may see that final payment of, I think it's somewhere in the neighborhood of 170,000, if I remember correctly, sometime in the near future. Good night. Um, I'll let you know when it comes in. Um, so uh, the paving on Route 100 by VTrans has made some progress with regards to our discussions with them, largely thanks to Frank on uh, 
treating some of those stormwater and, and infrastructure under Route 100 Main Street. And uh, Chris today talked to me about obtaining an email, uh, Dune, that you could sign, and I'd be glad to write it for you. He says that apparently VTrans, he didn't give me any background on this, so I think it's kind of interesting that they're doing this, prepared to do this now, but they are prepared to replace several storm drains on Main Street and drainage structures under the road, meaning pipes and connections to uh, some of the buildings along the street, along the road there, that need to be replaced. And which was something they originally said they were not. Right. I think they were a lot worse than they realized when they yeah. tried to run their little um, motorized camera down the way and it got about two feet and couldn't go anymore. <laughs> Interesting. Okay. So now they're prepared to do something about it. Um, and they're a little concerned because, of course, there will be disruption in the village at some point when they're doing this. Yeah. Which means there might be a day or so when some of the businesses aren't accessible by pedestrians and or parking will be um, you know, eliminated so that they can do the work, making the connections of the pipes under the ground and into the buildings. So they don't wanna run into opposition from folks because of that. Um, so they would like to know that, the, that you, the select board, so, prove um, what they're doing. I don't think it's pipes into the building. This is the storm stormwater drains. I right. think we're more concerned that there's just going to make it awkward for access to the uh, the buildings. But I don't okay. think there's any any anything um, connecting into the uh, no right. no okay no. yeah. Well, in any case, you know they're concerned about that. They don't want folks to be up in arms and disturbed about that. Uh, yeah, I think it's um, it wouldn't be more than realize that it needs to happen. Yeah. Yeah. So um, if it's all right, either you could do it if you want, or I'd be glad to draft something for you that you can send along to Chris that just says the select board reports what would be happening there. Yeah. And you make sure you would coordinate with business owners to, for, so they understand what's happening and how long it'll last. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Chris came in and chatted with me about that the other day. And if you would uh -huh. draft something up, I'd, that'd be great. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And then the last thing, just so you know, I've been working with Cooter to um, get ready to put out to bid the remaining road work under the, the FEMA 2019 storm. Um, there's five roads that need most ditching work and stone lining the ditches, one cross drain on Mount, Mount uh, Cushman Road. And uh, we had to kind of scramble because uh, questions were raised by FEMA, the environmental reviewers about whether we should have gotten uh, permits either from DEC and or Army Corps of Engineers for work we've done in 2019 and 2020. Um, this was never work that the town was ever required in the past to get permits for, but the FEMA reviewers are, are looking at it. They're asking the question. They're not saying necessarily that we should have, but they're suggesting that maybe we should have. So I've been doing a lot of work with them back and forth to try and figure out which culverts or which ditches they're talking about and whether they're even in the right place. And um, finally reached out to, to Chris Bump um, to ask his advice so we can um, get accurate information <coughs> from folks at the state level and at Army Corps about whether we did need to have permits and going forward, whether we would need any permits for the work we're planning to do this summer. Um, so that'll be something we're working on over the next couple of weeks. Um, and meanwhile, uh, Cooter has been able to touch base with the state at least and be told, he's been advised verbally that none of the work we're planning to go out to bid with uh, this month would require a permit from DEC but I need to get that in writing so that we don't run into a problem with that work. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so that's been taking up a lot of my time um, over the past couple of weeks and going forward, but hopefully that will be out, that work will be out to bid in April, in addition to the retaining wall, which is another FEMA project. Um, the drawings are nearly complete for that. So we'll put all that out to bid. And so we'll have quite a bit of work going on um, this, this, this year and have it all completed by the end of the calendar year. Um, 
Great, thank you. Hey, one, one other thing before we get off that, um, Pat, you and uh, Doon, did you guys have a chance to look over John's request for doing the paving? Yes, I did. Yeah. Yeah, it's, I think that's something we should approve so he can sign up for that so we can get on the list. Um, now so we should my, let him know that. My question was, uh, was there, is there still supposed to be some paving going on down at the town garage building? Um, only a small portion that's connected with the stormwater project. They're not gonna do the larger yeah. paving part of it. Um, so should that be included in what Cooter has written up here? Uh, I think that paving is part of that project. I think it's a separate, um, separate pot of money for that. Okay, but we shouldn't coordinate it so that when the pavers here, it does that. That would make sense to do that. Yeah. Oh. that would so now, so you are going to be doing that larger paving then? No, no, the little bit of paving that would would um, patch what they need to dig up when they install that. Um, well, that's that's part of that's part of what the WRP funding will cover. Yep, right. That's um, that just saying it would make sense to coordinate it so when that happens, it's when the pavers are already in town. But that's um, that's um, you know we'll see. Oh, so we're talking about paving combined. elsewhere. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. No. I'm not too sure he sent that to you, Joan. I'll forward what he sent to us. I don't know if you got that or not. I didn't know if you were on the CC list or not. No, this is from Cooter. Yes. Okay. Yeah. No, I haven't. I haven't seen that. I'll I'll forward that to you. Okay. I'm sorry. I should have. I I didn't even think of it. Okay. Yep. All right. Um. Well, that's a mouthful, Joan. Thank you. Um. Tony, um, any updates from the library? Uh, we're still doing the porch pickup and uh, I think there are some other things on the, on the uh, agenda here, but uh, our, we have a trustees meeting tomorrow at 545. That's good for this report, I think, thank you. Yep. All right. Um, so we're on to the new business. We've got the um, uh, collection of license renewals for the um, Huntington House. They've got a first class hotel license, third class hotel license, outside consumption, and caterers license approvals um, for that business. And is there any time limit on that, Dune? I mean, as far as the, at night, the outside consumption and catering license? Um, we had set a, I believe we had set a 10 o'clock. I don't think in the license it has that, um, but in the, um, in our, um, previously we had put a, a 10 o'clock cap, I believe, on outside and we could, um, I guess we could look into if we could approve that license with that contingency to make that hold a little more more weight. Um, I, I would think that would be a, a good idea just so that I know we've had complaints in the past and I'm, I don't want to cause them a lot of grief at the Huntington House, but I do think we need to, it is oh, kind no. of a residential area, so we just need to be careful there. No, that that's already in place. That was, that was either okay. last or, or the year before it might have even been in there. Yeah, I remember I remember yeah. you guys approving that. It was, you know, nothing after 10 o'clock outside. Yeah. Yeah, I was I was just checking. I wanted to make sure I couldn't see yeah. anything in the writing there and I didn't didn't know if anything was like that or what. Well, it did, <clears> so I was just good, asking. Good time to um reiterate that with um theoretically um Things getting more active this spring with the um, loosening of restrictions. So, yeah. Right, right. So um, I'd move to approve those applications with that um, um, stressing that 10 o'clock um, limit and uh, outside consumption. I can second that. And all in favor? Aye. All right. Aye. Right. Great. Um, that. And then um, 
There was um, something on here about the old firehouse building. Does anyone know what that is about? Uh, I'm not really sure. I, I did have the power shut off on it. Right, right. <laughs> you know, disconnected uh, after John got out of there. Because uh, I... I found out we found out it was cheaper to to disconnect it and re-energize yeah. in the yeah. in the fall there. So, um, it, so I, we, I'm not positive about this, and I don't know who it, but I think someone had approached them in the town office about inquiring about using that to do some assembly of some product, and I I don't think that's um anything that we're um you know that's. We're using it for summer storage of, of winter road equipment and, and winter storage of summer equipment. So I, I don't think I don't think we're looking at um, um, lending that out for for other purposes right now. So um, I and mean, they're not here to talk about it. So I guess that um, we'll move on from that. We have a um, oh, also from the library have a. Um, application for use of the park. Tony, you want to tell us what that's about? Still there? Still there? You're still, you're uh, muted still, Tony. Uh, we're asking to use the bandstand during the farmer's market times and days for uh, a storytelling thing. And also to be able to set up a uh, children's book reading program using uh, pages from, very, from stories uh, around the park. And this would mean uh, several stakes around the park with uh, pages that uh, kids would go to and read uh, from. So um, what would you call that, Tony? With a with a like a like a hunt or something? What would you call that? Like some sort of, sort of I don't think it's a. Is that someone else coming in? Uh, I don't. I don't think it's a. I don't know if it's much of a hunt, but it might be a little bit, and they'd go from position to position to to kind of read through books, and the books would change periodically. So it would be up there all summer? Uh, pretty much, yes. Um, how would that affect like when you had events like the Sunday night concerts and stuff? I don't think it would. These would be little stakes along uh, that would be uh, out of the way as much as possible. What about okay. mowing? So um, yeah, how's that going to work with the mowing? Well, we thought, talked about that too and with <laughs> the mowing. Um, I didn't hear that. Uh, There's some static in there. Okay, I said we have considered that, and we'd try try to make sure that it didn't interfere yeah. more. So, so if um, it seems, I don't know, it seems like it would make sense if this was something that came and went, like your um, storytelling on the bandstand, instead of a something that's up um, seven days a week. It might. Um, I know uh, it might end up being a little more special if it's something that comes and goes than if it's something that is just there all the time. I'd be concerned that the um, between the mowing and other activities on the park, it would be a um, um, might be a maintenance headache for you guys. Okay. Well, we would try not to have it be, but uh, anyway, the the idea is that people would be able to use it. I love I love the idea. Is it? Is it possible to use the trees that won't interfere with mowing? Well, that's a possibility. We're, we're not sure where we'd put them, but that that is a possibility to put them. Yep. They'd be fairly small and low because uh, we're dealing with kids here. So, and Maybe you could tie something around low down on, on some of the smaller trees. Right. That's a good idea. I don't, I don't think we want to get into that as, on a permanent basis. That just doesn't sound right to me. It sounds like it'd be more of a a nuisance than anything else. I mean, I, I, I understand the concept of what you want to do and, and maybe the, the park isn't the place for it. Maybe down along the edge of the river, along the ball field might be something that you could do and, and promote it that way. That would give you parking and access and, and plus it would 
get it out of the way. And I, I would be more concerned with, with somebody doing some serious damage to it or, or, you know, causing a nuisance. I, I think it would be more of a nuisance myself for that type of use. If it's something you're going to put up weekly and take it down every day, that's one thing, but I don't think leaving anything permanent out there is a good idea. Yeah, what about um, starting with just, um, you know, doing it alongside with the farmer's market when you have the yeah. the activity and the kids are looking for something to do while their their parents are talking and schmoozing and then, um, you know, explore the uh, explore it that way. Would that be acceptable? Well, I don't know, but we can certainly, uh, we'll talk about it and we'll get more information from other libraries and see what they're doing. Also. I think the Dune has a good idea because that's a good way to um, help publicize it as well as, you know, it's some, a special thing that's happening during the farmer's market. So while mom and dad are, you know, as Dune says, schmoozing and, and shopping, their kids have something fun to do. Yes, but don't forget, we're also doing that on or near the bandstand too. So that is happening there at that time. Yeah. So um, I would I would move to approve the application for the use of the bandstand during the, the farmers markets for the the, the storytelling, but um, then put a little more research into this the second half of your 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 ask the and it doesn't start till June, so we have a little bit of time. To think oh, yeah, that, that would be better. Yeah. All right. I have a um, second for that. I second that. The half approval. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Um, okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay. All right. Um, so concerns with commercial traffic through on Bethel Mountain Road, the perennial um, problem that we have with inappropriate vehicles driving over that mountain. Um, we have yet another drive of um, request to, to reach out and, and try and make something happen about that. I know Frank had gotten in touch with someone over in Bethel and trying to coordinate signage on both sides of the road. Frank, you want to talk about that? Um, yeah, I, I don't know if there's, uh, I don't know if people were supposed to speak on behalf of this project, but we're trying to avoid so much truck traffic on that road and, and uh, the GPS sends a lot of traffic that way. Um, Therese and I have have kind of worked she's gone on to the gps stuff and tried to do it that way and i've coordinated with her and we're trying to put a response together that works for both towns and we're we're doing it through the aot um i've got a couple emails out there i haven't heard back from my latest one um i was going to uh bone him up this week i think uh to get another approach but we're trying to look at signage maybe on 100 here uh, indicating the route to 89 being more uh, uh 100 to 107 and the same on route 12 and, and 107 there and 12 where it comes out of woodstock to try to keep them uh you know going in the idea that they use the the main state roads and not our uh Bethel Mountain Road. I, my biggest concern is entry into the village. It's, it's a real safety hazard here. And the problem with our signage we have now, it's, uh, it's kind of a little bit too late. They turn on to the park and they just see that little sign and they just go. So, and they have the same problem over there in Bethel. Once they make the turn on to Camp Brook, they're just, they're committed. They can't turn around. They can't go anywhere else. So they have to go. So, I haven't heard from the state, but um, yet and on the signage on Route 112 and 107 and 73 that maybe would help us alleviate some of that. We're not going to cure it. Um, there's going to be people that are going to abuse it anyway. But if we don't try to do something and something does happen and someone gets hurt or worse, uh, then at least we've made an effort. So I'll continue to work on it not something that's going to happen overnight but we'll we'll keep at it 
uh, I just want to say as someone who, who lives on the Bethel Mountain Road uh, as it enters the village, uh, there have been a number of incidents uh, where trucks brakes uh, catch fire, uh, where they lose their brakes by the time they get to the bottom of the hill. Most of them are drivers who follow GPS who had no idea the conditions they were about to go into. When we had the Bethel Mountain Road closed, the, the traffic was rerouted to 100. And I assume that that had to also have happened with GPS. There were signs, especially big signs on both sides. So it was when the Bethel Mountain Road uh, reopened, the Camp Brook Road too, that the traffic started going again. And you know these folks are following GPS. They have commercial trucking GPS. And you know maybe they're lucky if they have private, but from from uh, what the information I get, that a lot of the commercial GPS does not advise them as to that road. There is no runaway truck uh, ramp. There's no room for it, and so I think it's actually very critical and needs to be a priority uh, issue. That's just speaking from what I have lived. You know, I once had a truck that it was as high and as long as my house sit out front of my house for at least five hours till he could get the help and he was having his engine running you know so he could get the help he needed from his company it is a problem it's because we witness it we're more aware than than people who don't live on the road but also there's issue of of commuters and the experience that they get when they're literally crowded out by trucks on the top of Bethel Mountain Road. Mm -hmm. And I think that you received a letter, you received a proposal and a letter uh, from uh, Nancy Needham that really does uh, describe a horrifying experience that she had being wedged, being run off the road, being wedged when she was uh, transporting her mother somewhere. And this is, this is a real situation that we're dealing with here and it is a safety situation. And I would hope that the two select boards can get together and work this problem out. I was hoping to even have a situation where the two select boards would meet to, to really, you know, it, since it's a, a, it's a mutual issue for both towns and hammer this out. And Catherine, thank, we're thank in communication with each other on this issue. Okay, so, thank you know, you, we're trying to address it. It's going to take some time. It, it's a federally funded highway, so the state has a lot of say in it, and so do the feds. So, but, but we're trying road. to work out a solution. It is a town so. road. When you say it's a federally funded highway, because we get federal funds for transportation, I mean, most of the uh, road money that we get from the state is federal money. It's, you know, it's the towns can't pay for so, this. It's, a, it's literally a town road. It is. So, so there, are, there are things Frank, we can do and we can't do. So, we have to make sure whatever we do is legal. Well, of course. Yeah. So yeah, it's Bethel gonna take some time. It's not gonna happen overnight. Catherine, Bethel Mountain Road is a, is a town road, but it has a special designation because it's a major connector. So it does have a federal designation in addition to it still being a town road. Um, I know that's a little confusing, but that's the way it's been explained to me. Does it have it? Does it have a federal route attached to it? I mean, what does that mean, Joan? Uh, all all I know is that uh, it allows us to get federal money when repairs are needed, such as you know after the twenty nineteen storm, uh, which local roads would not have necessarily qualified for. Um, I I don't have all the details, so sorry, I don't know. Um, but it is a complicating factor that, you know, there's, um, well, but we're definitely try and exercise every option that we have to, to limit it, but we can't, um, I don't know what we're, well, Frank's working on trying to yes. peg down exactly what we can right. and cannot do in terms of, of restrictions on it. And, and I and appreciate that. on board with this. It's not, it's, we're, we're both working on it together. It's, it's something that we just, we talk about, we send emails to each other and, and we are trying to put a united front here and put pressure on all sides, but you know, it's just gonna take some time, that's all. But we are we are working on it. So yeah, we, and even, we hear, even we hear that, what the problems are. We, we're not yeah. immune to it. This is Deb Moore. I, I just like to say that I was talking with Susan Vanish yesterday we, we both saw that 
there was, I don't know if anybody here knows, there was an accident with two cars just, I think, the day before yesterday. And I think somebody got hurt. Um, and um, uh, I don't know any more details than that. But we were talking about this, and she, we were talking about what, if it is a town road, can we do some, can the town, while we're waiting for something more significant to happen, can the town legally put up like a great big sign, a really big sign, not just an ordinary sign, but just some kind of giant sign for all traffic to just say, you know, use lower brakes or, I mean, uh, lower gears or, you know, don't use your brakes or go very slow, dangerous, windy road or, or something, anything, and have it be very, very obvious. Because those little signs, you know, the little regular road, roads, people just ignore those. But if it's a really obvious, colorful or something, very different sign, people will see it. Um, there is a large, Deb, there's a large orange sign on the Bethel side, I noticed that's new to um, newer um, that I know Teresa from Bethel has uh, talked to me about how, how they had put that up and it's very specific about things you know they don't want on the on the road but of course they can't you know put a bar across and stop people from going they're just warning people but you're right a large sign you know large signs are helpful well we're, we're trying to get the state to give us a hand with that to to really put up some major signs where trucks don't make the decision to turn onto that road and then see a sign. Right. And that's really where our issues are lying, I think, more than anything else. And if you talk to the AOT, they tell you the only thing you can really do is signage. So, you know, as, as far as Rochester's side is concerned, um, to put a huge sign up on the park, maybe, uh, I don't know how that would go. Uh, well, I, was but, th I was thinking, but it's, that. it's, you know, we have to look at something and, and Therese and I are, are working together to try to alleviate this issue of, to somewhat, but there's no real cure for it. We're not saying we're going to fix it, but if we don't try and somebody does get hurt, then, yeah. you know, at least we've tried. There was a, a, the, so uh, we are working on it. The accident she may be talking about that I heard about was on um, over this past weekend with Java Hubbard. And it was at the end, uh, around the intersection of Bethel Mountain Road and Brook Street. Was that was on Friday. Yeah. That was Friday. Friday. Oh, Friday. Friday afternoon. And it was a one car accident. She, oh, I thought it was two cars. I, I uh, just, well, no, apparently there were three cars, but two of them had stopped to help. Oh. And what I heard from her? Kristen, who respond, was one of the responders, was that she swerved to avoid a, a, hitting a squirrel. Car. Oh no! But no, she, okay. uh, was she hurt? No, apparently she was all right. Yeah, I heard that they, they took her so, to be uh, looked at, but she came home. Uh, mm -hmm. my, sorry, uh, this is Jess Faircat. My my video doesn't work. My nephews live on that road and talked about the accident. They talk about accidents frequently, and of course, it's scary. I appreciate what you're doing, Frank, to to get some. <laughs> action and and movement on this um the gps i think is a a key part and from what i'm hearing the federal money might have something to do with why there was a gps uh you know deviation from that road when the road was down i don't know what we can mm -hmm. do to enforce that now but i do think deb's point about a sign could be helpful um where you're talking about, Frank, uh, I think that's uh, maybe a little uh, too far from where the accidents and where what causes the accidents happen. So I would be thinking more, gosh, I'm not great with directions, but up that Bethel Mountain Road, um, where drivers experience the twisty turns and then a, a drastic reduction in speed limit, I think a sign there might be more helpful. And as someone who does worry about my nephews and the stories they tell, and um, I do appreciate this being taken seriously. Yeah, I was I, thinking- I know we've got a steep grade sign up, up higher and things like that, but we I was really thinking, haven't put much signage after the road was rebuilt. 
but we, we still need to address it in a, in a manner that that works for everyone. And I, I, I want to throw was... one thing in um, about the situation, and that is all these signs and trying to make a change need some kind of enforcement to take place. There has to be some consequence. Otherwise, people will repeat and do things over and over again. And what I've heard is that Smuggler's Notch had big signs that truckers ignored. And the only thing that made a difference was when they started getting fined. And then the word went out amongst all the truckers and they started using different route. So I know we just have a limited number of hours with our enforcement uh, policy and, and actions, but I do think that enforcement is part of the solution as well. And I want to thank everyone who's spent time working on this. Um, um, Pat, 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 can I speak to that up. a little bit, Dune? We have looked at that, uh, Burma. Um, basically, what that road is under a weight limit. And we've looked at maybe a length limit or maybe an axle limit or or something where we could adopt the fine situation there, but that all has to be legal. And Teresa and I are, are talking to the AOT about this and trying to figure out if we can have something that has more teeth. And they are under like, a, they have a 20 hour constable uh, uh, deal that they have with their constable that, and we only have what, however many hours our sheriff puts in. So, you know, enforcement is a tough issue for both our towns. So, and we've requested a little more, maybe monitoring by the state police too, but they are really stretched in their facility uh, in their uh, ability to, to cover places too. So we're all just, you know, working as best we can to try to figure out a solution. Maybe some of the $322,000 could go for a little more enforcement. All booth. Maybe. <laughs> um, Pat, you, you've you been having your hand up for a while here. Um, I would like, Frank, since, you know, this is in your court right now, um, after we, we did the Bethel Mountain Road, I think the speed limit on the upper section of the Rochester side actually was increased. And as I read through the documentation that was submitted by the concerned citizens and Nancy Needham's um, account of what her scare was, her scare was uh, speed, um, not necessarily the fact that it was, you know, a large truck. It was a large truck coming around a corner at, at a speed. The speed limit on the upper section is 50. Uh, the speed on the other side, on the Bethel side, is, I think, 45. Uh, and of course, then the hill is 30. So um, we probably would have uh, a fairly easy time to reduce that speed limit to 45 or 40 on the upper part of the Bethel Mountain Road. And that would slow, you know, it, it won't get rid of the trucks, but it will slow them down. And, and Nancy would not have had the situation if that truck was doing the speed limit. It might not have been quite so scary for her. Um, so that's one thing I want to incorporate in that, and uh, as well as um, not endangering the fact that um, we could get uh, federal funds to to maintain that road. So that's one suggestion that I that I have for that. That would require us to pass an ordinance on yeah. that section of the road, we could, basically. So we did it. We did it on the lower section. Yeah, so. but that's that's what it would require. That's all yeah. I'm saying. I don't think that we'd have a problem getting the town to endorse that. Um, Nancy, no, it would just be a select board ordinance that we'd have to put Nancy, out there. You had something you want to say? I'm not sure how that road got moved up to 50. Uh, it 40 uh, and, and all of a sudden the 50 signs were there. So right. I don't know who did it. I, I, I think it might have just been a clerical error for whoever was buying the new signs for the road. Well, I was gonna say, I drove over that mountain every day to the Herald and for many, many, many years, and it said 40. Yeah. Um, Kevin, Doherty? I'm not sure. 
it was raised to 50 at a town meeting because somebody who drove over the road every day thought that it was too slow at 40 yeah. miles an hour and yeah. it was raised to 50. Do you have any point. when what uh, like what year that would have happened? I I don't. It was quite a long time ago. Like, give it, or take when what years? Last uh, years? Maybe 15 20 years ago. And are you saying it was I think a, a I think a review of our ordinances would show that because it, they yeah. would rate they have it spelled out where the speed limits are in town. Yeah. Right, so, that's probably true. And so I, a re I just, review like, of those would be where to go with that. I'd just like to add one thing. Thanks everybody for addressing this. Uh, the the truck problem has gotten a lot worse it, as numbers as well. And a lot of it is the skill of the drivers. A lot of the drivers who are sent over by GPS are not, they just don't seem to know how to drive. They ride the brakes, brake smoke, and uh, they do cut the corners. I drive this road every day, and I'd just like to thank the select board for um, paying attention to this and looking into it. Well, we'll keep after it, Kevin. I, I'm, uh, you know, on it every week. I try to do something with it to try to make see what we can do, and and I'm trying to talk to people that have have some control over the situation, so we can come up with a solution. And I Bethel have, wants to work with us and we want to work with them. So that's, I that's a step in the right direction. Throughout the time, through, throughout the last few years, um, if I see a truck on Bethel Mountain Road, um, I'll pick up my phone and snap a photo of their door, which has the phone number on it. Mm -hmm. And instead of reprimanding the, the truck driver, which you know, I, I thought maybe I might get myself killed one day trying to do that. So I pick up the, I snap my photo and I call dispatch for that trucking company. And, and I, I let, I speak my mind to that person um, because um, sometimes the drivers um, are designated to go that way. Yeah. And if they go around, it, it took them too long. Their route is specifically laid out to the minute on where they're supposed to be at all times. So um, I was fooled on that once too. So um, we have to get to the dispatchers. And, you know, I always felt, well, one at a time, uh, we just keep chipping away at it. Yeah, but uh, penalties and, and, and stiff fines would get to the dispatchers uh, much more effectively. Yeah, logistics. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I, well, I, I like agree with that. that. Just to throw one more thing out. Yep. I've noticed a lot of the trucks going over lately, especially the box trucks, are completely unmarked for whatever that's worth. Hmm. Weird. I would like to make a comment also. Susan Bannis was walking up Bethel Mountain Road toward her house, and there was a, a very large loaded truck that came around from Park House up to go to Bethel Mountain Road, and she stopped that truck driver and had a wonderful conversation with him and convinced him that he really needed to go south on 100, where he had just come from. It's totally a true story. Unbeknownst to me, uh, Nancy was watching and I had no idea, but uh, he was an older truck driver. I believe he owned his rig. And he was so thankful not to have a, a terrible ride. And yeah. I must say that um, it, it, I put a lot of energy into getting a, a united group of people. And I think that has been the missing element for success with Bethel Mountain. So I'm very encouraged and happy for both Bethel and Rochester that uh, they see it as a two town problem because it's one road that goes from one town to the other. And, uh, and I really appreciate Frank picking up the ball and starting to get going on it. And uh, it is clear that it's not a fast fix, but uh, that people care and continue to speak up is, the, is an important thing. So I think it's working out pretty good. Yeah, I'd just like to say one more thing about a big sign. Since 
as Frank said, this will be sort of an ongoing project and it's not gonna be an immediate fix. Then in the interim, and this is actually a question, it, would it be possible for Rochester to put at the top of the hill as, as tr anybody's coming down, trucks or cars, just this giant sign so it, it can't be ignored? Is that a possibility? I mean, is, is there any reason we cannot do that? And if we can do that, who would do it? How would it get done? I mean, I think it's worth really discussing and not just, you know, forgetting about. And I think what Deb is trying to say is use low gear, uh, whatever yeah. your rig is, whether you got 20 wheels, <laughs> four wheels. Mm -hmm. And I know there is a grade sign up there, but maybe something short term and more dramatic mm -hmm. uh, before they, you know, before it's too late to hit your low gears uh, exactly. could be considered. There used to be a sign that said use low gear, but I think that's disappeared. There was a sign on the corner by the Huntington House Inn that you saw if you were coming up the road from, you know, Route 100 and you were going to go over Bethel Mountain Road, there was a sign there on the right. But is that still there? Because I don't remember seeing it the last time I went over. No, I know you've probably seen it so many times you don't see it anymore, right? Uh, that could be it. That could be it. All right. The um, use, use the low gear sign was on the downward side, and I thought that was good when it was there, but it hasn't been there for a long time. And I also want to thank the select board and Frank, especially for taking this up. Yeah. Yes, I got quite a long. Um, uh, I, taught, I had quite a long talk with Teresa, the town clerk from Bessel the other day about that on the phone. She called to tell me something and then she went on about that and she's very concerned as, as Frank knows. So can't blame her. Yeah, Deb, I'll, I'll look into that uh, signage issue. I'll, I'll talk with John about it and see what we can come up with. Oh, great. Thank, Thank you for you. that. But you also don't want trucks going through the hollow. If you've got a sign No, no we, we no. got a we got to hit it on Route 100 and Route 12. Route, yeah. You got to do it before they make the turn. And, and I think the state's agreeing with us on that, but I haven't really had official word on that yet. So uh, they, they're worried about, they're concerned about it too. They, they have issues. Right. It's not a new problem for them. They, they do know about it. So <coughs> the more we talk to them, the more we might be able to get something done. Good work. Thank All you. right. Um, um, is that enough for Buffalo Mountain Road tonight? I think we've got yes. some good momentum going here. The last thing I have on the agenda here was the approval for a driveway permit for a new construction going in um, near the intersection of Oak Lodge Road and Fisk Road. But I haven't had a chance to get with um, John Champion on that and get his input on that so i I'd, I'd like to um put that off a little bit so i can confer with him on that okay right so sounds like a good idea yep um so that is unless anyone else has anything that they think we forgot to talk about tonight that's all i have so you have no executive session tonight no not tonight okay okay thank you no, I have executive session with dinner. <laughs> oh my gosh, and it's quarter of eight already. Yeah. So, all right. Well, um, thank you all for coming. And um, on a personal note, if you're still listening, Kirk, your bike's ready. <laughs> thank you all for coming. Thank you, everybody. It's wonderful to live in a town where everybody cares so much about everything. Yeah. Thank yeah. You. Good. All right. Thank you, folks. Good night. Night. Good night. Night. Good night. Thank you.